Hi, I'm Aura, and I'm the host of Collective Mind, and I'm going to be doing like an overview of what DID is, and to some extent what it isn't, <laughs> covering some common misconceptions, but mostly just going through the diagnostic criteria as it is in the DSM-5. So I'm going to start with the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, like I said, and I'm going to show the word-for-word descriptions of the criteria that I pulled from my university's access to the DSM-5. I'll put them one by one on the screen as I go over like a simplified version of essentially what that criteria means. So the first one is the long one, and it's one of the two main criteria for the disorder. So the criteria is broken down essentially into two like the two defining characteristics of the disorder, the one defining characteristic of all disorders, and then two things to rule out. So this is one of the defining characteristics of dissociative identity disorder, according to the DSM-5. The disruption of identity with two or more distinct personality states, that's just alters. So it's two or more total alters in the system, and that's including the host. So like, in our system, I'm the host, and I am one of the alters. It's not like there's one real person and then other alters. <laughs> They're all alters, so all of the people in the system are alters. The discontinuity between um, or in sense of self and sense of agency means you feel like different people. So I feel like a different person than Jade, for instance, our primary external protector, among other things. <laughs> but you also don't feel in control of what the other alters do. So when Jade is fronting, I have no control over what she does, other than like the kind of control that another physical person in the room would have over me, so they could give me suggestions. <laughs> but they couldn't force me to do something a certain way, at least in most cases. And then that's accompanied by alterations in a bunch of things. Affect, behavior, consciousness, memory, perception, cognition, and or sensory motor functioning. So that's just differences between different alters. So I am different than Jade in a bunch of ways. <laughs> and that's one of the key things to look for in like distinguishing alters from other types of experience that can kind of look like alters, is they'll be pretty different in a lot of cases, at least in DID. The criteria for OSDD is different, but I'm focusing on DID for this video. And it is important to note that that last detail says that the symptoms can be observed by the person diagnosing you or reported by the person being diagnosed. So in our case, our therapist had met multiple alters before officially giving us a diagnosis, but that's not required for a diagnosis. If I had just described a bunch of experiences that our therapist recognized as fitting this criteria we would not have needed to switch in front of him or had him meet several alters or any of those things. Which didn't used to be the case, that is one of the more recent changes in the diagnostic criteria for DID. Now starting with the second one, I can make it bigger and easier to read because the rest of the separate sections of the criteria are much shorter than that first one. So the sec this second one is the second major distinguishing factor about this disorder from other disorders, and this is amnesia. So those two distinguishing characteristics for DID basically boil down to alters and amnesia. <laughs> so this second one is recurrent gaps in recall, so memory gaps, in day-to-day -day life, in important information about yourself and your own life, and or trauma, in most cases childhood. So, and it specifies inconsistent with ordinary forgetting, so everybody forgets some things. It's not DID level amnesia to forget where you left your keys or what you ate for breakfast three weeks ago. 
So that's something that whoever is doing the diagnosing would determine if the level of forgetting seems normal or seems, um, what's the term? Clinically significant. But it is important to note that this is something that I've seen a lot of people like slightly misinterpret in a way that matters a lot. There's a really important and or right here, which means that for a DID diagnosis, you do not have to have all three of those major categories of amnesia. You can have one or two of them. You can have all three, but you can have just one or two of them and still meet the criteria for a DID diagnosis. So if you meet the rest of the criteria for a DID diagnosis, and you only have like trauma-related amnesia, but not day-to-day, -day, you would still meet the criteria for DID. You wouldn't be diagnosed with OSDD instead, at least you shouldn't be, if that's the only thing <laughs> that doesn't quite line up with what most people think of as the DID diagnosis. You don't have to have all three of those major types of amnesia. Alright, the third one. This is the distinguishing characteristic of just disorders in general. As far as I know, I think every disorder in the DSM-5 has this as a criteria. I'm not positive, I haven't checked all of them. I know it's usually there at least. But this is essentially the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act definition of disability. So it's clarifying that the disorder has to be a disability level impairment in your day-to-day -day life. So it uses the phrase clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, which just means it makes at least one ma major area of life difficult enough that is considered clinically significant. So it has a significant negative impact on at least one major area of your life. Which again, is the ADA definition of a disability. So DID is definitionally a disability. At least in the United States. <laughs> There's some people around. I think Jade and Jaden are both hanging around. Okay, and now we're on to the two criteria that say, watch out for these things, because if it's one of these things, that would be an exception, where the above criteria would, would not mean a DID diagnosis. So, religious practice, or like broadly a cultural practice of some kind, where it's an accepted part of that, or what is considered to be normal play in children, like having an imaginary friend. Those wouldn't meet the criteria, they would be exceptions for meeting the criteria for DID. And then finally, it's not due to drugs or alcohol or a medical condition like seizures. So if you act totally different when you're drunk and then don't remember being drunk the next day, that's not DID. <laughs> And if you have like absent seizures, for instance, where you don't remember doing things that you did or like staring off into space for a long time or things like that and you don't remember it afterwards, that's also not DID. All right, now into the misconceptions. So these are the ones that came to mind pretty easily when I was planning out this video. I have almost definitely missed some that I'll kick myself about later, but these are the ones that came to mind right away. So first of all, DID is not psychosis. It's not a psychotic disorder. You can have psychosis in addition to DID, but it won't be from the DID. So the voices, like of alters from inside, don't sound like they're from the external world. That's one of the ways to distinguish between psychosis and DID, is when Jade's talking to me from inside, I don't confuse that for somebody talking to me physically in the room I'm in. It's a totally different experience. So it 
passes that test of not being psychosis. And same thing with like generally distinguishing the inner world from physical reality. We can tell the difference between inner world experiences and physically out here in the external world. It's also not a personality disorder, which was one of the confusing things about the old name of multiple personality disorder. It would make people think it was personality disorder, which it's not. It's a dissociative disorder. And like secondarily to being a dissociative disorder, it would be trauma stressor related and neurodevelopmental. So it's not Again, not psychosis, not a personality disorder, not even secondarily. Also, like I said earlier, it's not one real person and then a bunch of parts or imaginary people or like less fully developed people or anything like that. It's not a real one and then the rest. <laughs> Alter doesn't mean like some kind of less than real extra person. It's everybody in the system. So, if you're going to make the argument that alters aren't like real people or fully formed people or anything like that, you have to make that argument about literally everyone in the system. Which I imagine some people would make that argument. I personally wouldn't. <laughs> so the theory of structural dissociation, which is still the leading theory, as far as I'm aware, of how DID forms in childhood, is the idea that children are not born with one personality, they're born with separate like ego states, personality states, responsible for meeting different needs, and there wouldn't be amnesia between these states. But if trauma disrupts the process of integrating all of those separate states into one personality, which this is why it's neurodevelopmental. <laughs> if trauma disrupts that process, then amnesia would separate those different areas of the brain and those areas would then develop personalities of their own, which is why there's amnesia between them and why they have different personalities because life experiences dramatically shape people's personalities. But even if you were to ignore that theory and say that someone starts with one personality and then when they develop DID, that personality breaks apart into a bunch of little pieces, none of those pieces would be more or less real than the other ones. There still wouldn't be one fully formed person and then a bunch of pieces to the side. It just wouldn't work like that. Having alters is not inherently bad or harmful. So the the alters part of the disorder, like the, there being more than one person in the body, is not like, it's not purely dysfunctional because it's a coping mechanism originally. It's a, one of the brain's coping mechanisms to trauma is dissociation to that extent. So. I would actually argue that even amnesia isn't inherently dysfunctional. That is more dysfunctional, I would say, than alters generally. But the amnesia has a purpose too. So like there's a reason that the system functions that way and making dramatic sudden changes can be very harmful, but I just... I don't agree with the narrative that having multiple alters instead of one person is like somehow a lesser life generally. I think it varies a lot system to system and I think there can be very different types of relationships between alters and that that affects that a lot but like like if i'm dealing with a persecutor for instance the fact that that alter exists isn't the problem it's 
their behavior and the harmful coping skills that they've learned. So, I just, I strongly believe that the existence of alters generally is not inherently negative. Back to persecutors. We've actually made a video on persecutors. If you want to watch that, I would recommend it. But alters aren't dangerous. Nothing about DID makes someone dangerous. Nothing about the criteria that we just went over inherently says someone is dangerous. So anyone, including anyone with DID, can be dangerous, but nothing about DID makes someone dangerous. In the most common ways that systems are perceived as violent or dangerous, that I've seen at least, is situations that are self-defense or directed inwards at themselves. Another big one is if something about a system is different than you've seen in other systems, that doesn't mean they're faking. It doesn't like prove that they're not faking either, but that's not your responsibility to determine whether or not they're faking unless you're their doctor. And systems can be vastly different from each other. The diagnostic criteria is fairly broad. There are two key requirements that distinguish it from other disorders, and within those requirements, systems can be extremely different from each other. And a lot of systems have talked about fake claiming and how harmful it is, so I'm just gonna mention that because it is important to mention, but I'm not gonna get super into it right now. But fake claiming dramatically hurts real systems, whether or not the system you fake claim is faking. So even if you happen to be right, you're still hurting real systems because real systems who experience similar things will see that that system was called out for those things and deal with like a denial spiral because of it in a lot of cases, and it can make just the community in general feel unsafe to be a part of. Also, being wrong or ill-informed is not the same thing as faking. So if someone says something that they call DID and it doesn't fit the definition of DID, that doesn't mean that they're not experiencing what they say they're experiencing, and it also doesn't actually mean that they're not experiencing DID. Confusion does not equal faking. Kind of already said this, but just more specifically, the details of what alters can be and what inner worlds can be and all of that can be so different between systems. Brains can do a lot of stuff, and since a lot of this uses especially a child's brain to just imagine things that would be helpful, there aren't really limits to that. And then the other big one is amnesia. Levels of amnesia and communication can vary a lot between systems and even within a system between different alters. So like my level of day-to-day -day amnesia is way lower than almost anyone else in our system. And my level of communication with different alters varies drastically. There are some still that I don't even know exist. <laughs> Never mind have communication with them. And there are some who I can communicate with very, very easily. So it just depends a lot. And finally, one of my biggest pet peeves that people still seem to believe for some reason is that DID is super, super rare, like so rare that the odds of you actually meeting someone with DID is like inconceivable which just isn't true. The DSM-5 lists the prevalence of DID at 1.5%, which is very comparable to many other disorders in the DSM that are not considered rare. So I don't know why people think DID specifically is rare when it has a similar prevalence in the DSM as a bunch of other disorders that aren't considered rare. So that is everything on my list. If you have questions or comments or have misconceptions that I missed or anything like that, feel free to leave them in comments or come over to our Discord server. The link to that, as always, is in our description box. And 
there is some, there's a link to some information also, as always, about DID in the description box as well. If there's a bunch of comments about misconceptions that I missed, maybe I'll make a part two. But yeah. have other ideas for videos this was one recommended on on discord was to do like an adult version of an overview of what DID is because I did make a, an episode of small talk about the basics of DID but this was this went into more detail for sure and was more like I referenced the the, cri the actual criteria from the DSM the whole time and everything. So this one in a little more depth for sure. But if you have other ideas for videos you want to see us make, feel free to let us know. We will probably see it if you put it in comments, but we have a whole channel dedicated to that on our Discord server, so that would be the best place probably. Because that's also a place where people can vote on it and let us know if they're also interested in your idea, so. But yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.